Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Claridge, and welcome back to another edition of Emergency Medicine Cases Rapid Review. Here we're going to give you the second half of the hyperkalemia quick review. This is going to be to the point, so hold on tight. You're going to learn what to do with that potassium value, specifically, how do you make it all better? And when there's no pulse, how do you throw that kitchen sink? Let's get right into it. It's useful to think about the management in terms of three core principles. Stabilization of the cardiac membrane, shifting potassium into the cells, and elimination of potassium. But the real question is, at what potassium value do we need to initiate each one of these treatments? When do we start calcium? When do we start driving that potassium into the cells? And when do we start eliminating it altogether? And that's what I'm going to show you next. Let's go back to some of the things we learned from part one. You have hyperkalemia, patients on a monitor with IV access, you get the ECG, there are two options. The ECG looks okay, like there are no concerning changes, or the ECG has changes associated with hyperkalemia. Let's stop right there. So the ECG has changes. This is where we need to initiate immediate treatment. ECG changes can occur from any value of potassium to 5 to greater than 6.5. But we also know that serum potassium values don't correlate with ECG changes. So another indication to initiate treatment is any potassium value greater than 6.5. All right, so let's reiterate because this is really, really important. If the potassium value is between 5 and 6.5 and the ECG has changes, or the potassium value is greater than 6.5 regardless of the ECG, then we need to initiate treatment. And we do this by stabilizing the cardiac membrane and driving potassium into the cells. If the potassium value is between 5 and 6.5 and the ECG looks okay, then all we need to do is enhance excretion. Let's get into how we do these things. To stabilize the membrane, you have two choices, calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. The most important difference to recognize is that calcium chloride has three times the amount of elemental calcium than gluconate. This makes it more dangerous and therefore should only be used in the peri-arrest or arrest patient. Whereas calcium gluconate is for everybody else. Take that amp of calcium gluconate, put it in a mini bag and give it over five to 10 minutes and repeat. This is important. One amp may not be sufficient. You may need up to three amps. Repeat the ECG and see if there's an effect, like the QRS is less than 100 milliseconds or the P waves start to reappear. What about the idea of giving calcium to that patient on digoxin and leading to the dreaded stone heart? This has largely been debunked. If dig toxicity is suspected, then give calcium gluconate over a longer period of time, like 20 to 30 minutes. Next, how do we shift that potassium? There are two mechanisms. One, we give two amps of D50W and 10 units of insulin R, monitor the glucose every 30 minutes, and repeat the potassium in ECG at one hour. Repeat this until the potassium is less than six. Now the second therapy is salbutamol. This works synergistically with insulin. Give eight puffs via an aero chamber or 20 milligram NEBS. This can cause a transient rise in potassium. So it's important to remember to always give after insulin and not as a monotherapy. In terms of bicarb, experts do not recommend routine use. It may play a small role in a subset of patients who have a non anion gap metabolic acidosis, such as RTA. There are two routes for elimination, the kidneys being the main one. Establishing good urine flow is paramount, so insert a Foley catheter. If they're chronically anuric, then don't bother. Just make sure they're euvolemic. Most patients will be hypovolemic, so give crystalloid not ringers, as it contains a small amount of potassium. There's no role for diuretics unless they're hypervolemic. If they're on dialysis, then get dialysis. Speak to nephrology early. Potassium can also be eliminated through the GI tract, but in the ED, this is not a major route. Some physicians gravitate to caexalate. We don't recommend it. If you're considering using this method of elimination, then use PEG, especially if the patient is going to be in the ED for long periods of time. So now we know what tools we have, what do we do in the situation of cardiac arrest due to hyperkalemia? All right, so CPR is in progress. You're following ACLS guidelines. 
and then a stat blood gas showing a potassium value of nine. It all of a sudden clicks that wide complex on the monitor, the recently missed dialysis. You've got the full picture. Now, how are we going to empty that kitchen sink and bring this patient back? We begin by pushing one amp of calcium chloride. That's right. I said chloride. Get it going in a well running peripheral IV or central line. Continue to give until the QRS is less than 100. Give epinephrine 10 mics IV, which will potentially shift the potassium intracellularly. You can also give sodium bicarbonate, especially if the patient is thought to be profoundly acidotic. Once you get a pulse back, then you need to implement the rest of the management strategy. Remember, you save this patient predominantly because of the administration of IV calcium. This can last as little as 20 to 30 minutes. You might need to give it again. Start normal treatment with insulin, glucose, and subutamol, and call nephrology early for dialysis. This brings us to the end of hyperkalemia. Let's do a quick summary. Remember the three core principles, stabilizing, shifting, and eliminating. Remember that immediate indications to stabilize and shift being potassium value between 5 and 6.5 with ECG changes and all potassium values over 6.5 and remember how to throw that kitchen sink in the setting of cardiac arrest. Thank you all for listening, and see you again next time.